Curtis and wonderful to be able to sing praises together. I, I really enjoy, I'll say, getting to hear some melodic things coming from the front corner and I try to sit there and sing parts and then when, when the Radabas are here getting it, it's just wonderful to be able to sing praises to God and so it's, it's great to be able to do as a congregation and to be able to enjoy that time singing to Him. Our Father is absolutely wonderful, and as I was listening to the first message today, I thought, wow, isn't that a unique topic to be able to have? Because today I'd like to also talk about self. Um, if you've ever, if you were a kid and you were trying to like come up with some uh, backing for something that you had, you might say, wow, there are three other people who concur, you know, there's me, myself and I you know and so there are the three of us and then if you go further on in in school and maybe in sociology you also hear that there this whole idea of how we look at ourself um, is there are some things that are uniquely human where we can have uh, they say that you, um, I think it was Freud who said you have the id, the ego, and the superego, and how you look at it. And you can have either have like a caveman brain, or you can all the, the there's these various ways that people will come up with, um, essentially talking about self, talking about how we view a situation, and they'll try to extrapolate out exactly what that means for how we have to interact with one another, what it is that we might have to overcome. Today, I'd like to talk about three selves. And those three selves are self-pity, self-deprecation, and self-examination. Now the traits of any individual can manifest themselves in a multitude of ways, but I would dare say that the best way to see these traits is in other people. <laughs> And God will bear that out. He says, well, if there's a time, you know, it's easy to go see the moat in someone else's eye. And we were, oh, we're, we, can, we can see someone else. When they have a self-pity party going on, you hear the whining a mile away. You just know it's happening. Somebody who's just unwilling to accept gratitude and thanks for, the, oh, they'll just be constantly self-deprecating. Um, and you, so you can see these things in other people. And I'm not saying that that's where it should stay. However... When we see them in others, we should be able to then take it and not just look into a mirror and immediately turn away and forget what we have seen. We should be able to take that and turn it on ourselves and consider whether or not we are there. Again, moving to that third self. So today, again, I want to look at these three selves, self-pity, self-deprecation, and self-examination. The first one, self-pity. Seems pretty self-explanatory there. It's pity for oneself. However, it moves beyond that because, you know, sometimes you can feel really bad about what's going on in your life. But it moves beyond just that. It becomes a self-indulgent attitude concerning one's own difficulties or hardships. So it can go from just having a desire for pity, right? Oh, do you realize how difficult life is? It's really tough. I mean, I've got a lot on my plate right now. And there are times where we have a lot on our plate. And what do you do when you have a lot on your plate and it's hard to bear? Well, we talk to people who are close to us. We ask God for strength. We, we, we go to other people because it's a lot to bear. But then to move beyond that and just really try to throw yourself a pity party wherever you go because of how difficult it is, it can get to be a little bit difficult to... Um, move beyond that because it can become a little bit of who we are. Let's look at an example of this in 1 Kings 21. This is uh, somewhat humorous but also um, very, very striking in, in what ends up happening. But 1 Kings 21, we see here um, King Ahab, not the best king of Israel, um, but uh, Nahab, not Nahab, Ahab is a uh, king, and it came to pass, verse 1, 1 Kings 21, verse 1, it came to pass after, three, after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, um, king of Samaria. So he's up there, he's in Israel, he's in Samaria, he's the king, 
And there's a guy who has a vineyard next to him. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth and money. So first of all, it seems pretty good. We'll trade. We'll do a swap. It's, I'm not just going to take your land. Um, I'll, I'll give you its worth and money. I'll pay you what it's worth. Kind of sounds a little bit like the, uh, um, the deal when, when Abram bought the... Uh, bought the cave of Machpelah, right? You have this discussion about how to go about getting this piece of property. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So this was his inheritance. You can go back through scripture, you can see there was a lot that God had in place to make sure that families could retain their inheritance all the way down to, I shouldn't say all the way down to, but including the, um, the year of release, the Jubilee, to be able to make sure that people could have a means of survival. And so Naboth says, this is my family's inheritance. Uh, God forbid that I give that to you. So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. Life's tough when you're the king and somebody won't give you their vineyard so that you can have a vegetable garden. But you know, honestly, when you think about it, humanly speaking, this is not too dissimilar from the story that Nathan accounted to King David. He's like, oh, there's this one king who had whatever he wanted, everything, but what did he want? He wanted the one lamb that this other guy had. So here is, is Ahab, he's got all of this stuff, everything that he wants, everything you possibly need, but what does he want? Oh, the thing that he can't have. And so, kind of like King David, things progress. Verse 5, But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And so, again, he's pretty sullen. Would you say he's throwing himself a pity party? A little bit. He's feeling really sorry for himself. Sadly, it does not turn out too well for Naboth, a man who is following along with what God says. So Jezebel goes and just kills him and takes it. Um, but pity for oneself, especially a self-indulgent attitude. The one thing that he can't have is what he wants most. Let's go to 1 Kings 19, just a chapter before. You might say, or two chapters before, you might say, well... That was an evil, vile man. Bad people feel sorry for themselves. Well, here let's look at an individual again who is going through a difficult time. 1 Kings 19, verse 13. This is the prophet Elijah, a man used to do many powerful signs and wonders. As you recall, Jezebel put a price on his head and he went running for the hills quite literally and so he's off he's he's in a cave god has sustained him he's made sure he had food and he went on this on that food for the uh, the strength of that food for 40 days he's in a cave and he has the wind and the, the stones and uh, the earthquake the fire all of this stuff goes on but it was verse 13 when elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and suddenly a voice came in and said what are you doing here elijah what are you doing here now also, as a backstory, before we go in and we read everything, Elijah, when he had gone out, he met with the prophet Obadiah. And Obadiah had talked to him and said, you know, I'm preserving these people. I can't go and tell Ahab that stuff. Uh, he's going to kill me. He's already been hiding prophets in the cave, bringing them food, taking care of them. And so, but Elijah went on the run. And so when God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He, he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Is he really alone? Is he being a little bit hyperbolic in how he's explaining what's going on? So he's saying, they're, they're coming here to take my life. They want they want to take my life going on. 
And then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the winner's Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu the son of Nimshai as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat, uh, uh, Shaphat uh, of Abel you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So God goes, and in the conversation, takes the opportunity to be like, you're kind of going over the top, Elijah. It's not exactly as you say it is. Now also recognize that I've preserved you. you know, Jezebel has not found you. You're out here in the wilderness. I gave you 40 days to take a break. Now go get back to work. It was like, oh, do you realize how tough it is? I can't go back there. I've, I've been so zealous for your way. I alone am left. And there are times in life that we can really feel that. I mean, how, how, I mean, how difficult is it when you're isolated? And, and I think that we've all probably experienced something like that over the last couple years. And at other times in life, in other ways, it's not just isolation from church, but perhaps within family, perhaps... Again, if you go back towards, uh, towards other times where we had um, splits and, schism and the, schisms in the church, and you can just feel as if you've been left. And that's a feeling that, I'm not saying that it's the worst thing in the world, but these are human feelings. These are things that we experience, and these are things that we go through. And Elijah was going through this. Ahab was going through that. And that self-pity. Oh, it's horrible. You know what? You couldn't possibly understand what I'm going through right now because it's so bad. You've never experienced something like this. It says every teenager ever, including me. When I'm, oh, nobody could imagine it. And Elijah's kind of doing this, and Ahab's kind of doing this. Let's go. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 20. This is not something that only besets individuals who do not have a vision of God's kingdom or an understanding of what he's doing. This is something that besets any warm-blooded, living human being, because we're just not capable of handling everything that life throws at us. God has made us incomplete in that way, so that hopefully we'll progress to a point that we'll get to later in this message. But Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7. Jeremiah was called to do a difficult thing. As it says in the New Testament, there's a king who has a, a, a ruler who has a kingdom, the people don't want him to rule over it, so he puts his servants to do business in his stead. In a hostile environment, go and do these things. Increase the, the, uh, the talent and the money that I've left with you. Do business until I return. And Jeremiah's here. He's an unpopular guy doing the work of a God that the whole nation wanted to ignore. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7, it says, O oh Lord, you induced me. And I was persuaded, you are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. God, you're stronger than me, and so I'm doing this. You're kind of like forcing me to do this, God. And everyone is making fun of me. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted, violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me. A reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And he's like, I tried not to talk about this. I tried to shut it up. I mean, I was just so tired of being so unpopular. I was like, I'm done with this. However, it was burning in my heart, and I couldn't hold it back. For I heard many mockings, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, Perhaps he, can't be, he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. So they're, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to catch him in whatever he's saying. Oh, he's saying that? <laughs> We're going to undermine him. Everyone's against him. Every man's hand was against him. Oh, that's difficult. Now, everything that Jeremiah is sharing here is, is accurate. You read through the account, and this is what people were doing. However... When that's all that we see, and that's all that we allow ourselves to reflect on, we get into this category of self-pity, because is that all that was happening? No. He was still alive. God was protecting him. Now, he could have died in the pit, but God made sure he got taken out. 
Many people died when they didn't listen to Jeremiah and they went down to Egypt and they're trying, or they're trying to fight back and God said, don't do this. And all along the way, he's saying God's word. But guess what? God preserved him, right? And in those moments where we're going through difficult times, when we know God's plan, it can be so easy for us to only see the negative side of things and only present that and, oh, whoa, am I. And we get into that point of being self-pitying. The second self that we're going to talk about today is self-deprecation. Self-deprecation. Now, this is something that, unlike self-pity, I mean, when you hear somebody throwing themselves a little pity party, most people are like, oh, you know what you're getting into. You just divert and go have a conversation with somebody else. Or, you know, there are these things that when you see somebody in the midst of that, you just, you like, don't want to... <laughs> There's a lot of drama going on over there. I'm going to go over here and divert. Self-deprecation, though, is a belittling or an undervaluing of oneself. It's a belittling or undervaluing of oneself. Being excessively modest. When you have someone, and I would, I would dare say that within the Church of God, as we look at things, as we strive to do what is right, uh, with a Christian mindset, this can catch us. You know, we know, oh, don't feel bad for yourself. We know God is there to sustain us. And even though we all probably verge into the self-pity side of things at times, we know that's not where we want to be. But when we get into the self-deprecation side of things, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to, um, to pinpoint or to identify. But it is something that I would say happens quite a bit within the Church of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Because, uh, like we heard in the, the first message, you know, that selfishness, that aspect of human nature that desires so much to promote oneself, whether it's at work or in the eyes of others, we're like, oh, that's bad. Run from that to the opposite side of things, and no, 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 we end up belittling or undervaluing oneself. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, 3, we'll read this. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be, trans do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say... Through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You see, a lot of times we'll just pull out of this scripture, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But nested in that, is that there is a certain degree, if you keep reading, there's a certain amount of faith that God has injected and given to individuals. And we can, as a father who cried out to Christ, he said, Jesus, please heal my son. He says, do you believe? He says, I believe, help my unbelief. That's faith. Help my faith. Increase my faith. And, you know, and so we may, may be dealt a measure of faith, but it's something we can all ask to be increased. And at times, you know, God does that. He gives it. But there is a certain mindset as we think of ourselves, we're not supposed to think of ourselves too highly. That means there are times as we look at things and we're looking at what God is doing as the sacrifice that he, we ought to be, there is a value that is there. And we don't want to undervalue what God has obviously valued as supremely valuable. So much so that it, it's worth the life of his, of his son. That's a pretty valuable thing. So I'm not saying we ought to think highly or too highly of ourselves, which is exactly what Romans says, but going to the point of self-deprecation can be dangerous. Let's go to Luke 18. We'll see another example of this. Luke 18. This is the instance of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Luke 18, verse 9 is where we'll pick it up. Jesus is speaking this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. So they're doing the exact opposite of what we read in Romans 12. They were thinking of themselves more highly than they ought. That selfish side of things. Not the selfless side of things, but the selfish side of, thing, side of things. And he says to them, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. 
The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, there's a, there's a, it is a razor's edge, a tenuous balance between flipping to self-deprecation from being humble. We can be humble and we can understand what we are in the sight of God. And there is going beyond that to undervalue it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 brings out another aspect of this. See, when the man was going before, the tax collector was going before God, and he wouldn't even come close, right? he recognized that as a sinner, there was a certain breach of the relationship. But it didn't mean that he shouldn't go before God. Right? And if we're a human being, I think we've all had moments where we have made a mistake, and we have allowed our guilty conscience, which actually is derived from pride, to keep us from going to God, because we're either ashamed or we're scared, and then it, that can snowball so quickly, and then it takes us a long time to go to God. And so we don't. But yet, this man recognized that he had the opportunity. We, we can read in Hebrews, we can boldly go before the throne of grace. We can go to Him, and we need to. And there is a certain amount of brazenness and courage that it takes to go and do that and not just feel so undervalued that we can't go to God because God always wants to hear from us he wants us to come to him here in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20 uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 says for you see your calling brethren that not many wise according to the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called so for the rest of you who aren't mighty or noble that's a joke no, but uh, we can look at that and we can say like, oh, well, not many of us are here, not, not many of us. But that's not the way that we want to look at this is a good reminder because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But you... Or sorry, but, if him, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So this puts it in the right place. We have what we have, and we are who we are, and we have the wisdom that we have, because God has given it to us. And that's an amazingly precious gift. He says there are wise men who desire to know what we know, and they will not know it. They want to see what we see, and they cannot see it. It's an amazing gift. We can recognize who we are at our core, and that there are not many wise or noble who are called, not many mighty, because God has a purpose. And so while that might be our start, again, you go to the parable of the talents, is that supposed to be the conclusion? No. It's an amazing transformation along the way. And so, you don't want to devalue, again, what God is investing in. Who wants to sit there and cut the legs out from underneath of their uh, retirement fund that they're putting in? It's like, oh, no, no, so I'm going to go ahead and say something bad so that my whole retirement fund just goes, whoop, becomes valueless. No, God's saying, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting money, I'm, I'm investing into these individuals. Don't devalue them. Don't undermine that. Don't be excessively uh, uh, belittling or anything like that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4. I think one of the bits of confusion, you know, we just read in, in 1 Corinthians 1, it says God has called the weak and the base, but he has not called the worthless. And I think that's a, there's a big difference. In, in Christendom, Christendom, the concept of humility is an ever-present one. We, we read about that um, in Luke 18. He who humbles himself will be great. But there is a need 
for us to distinguish between humility and self-deprecation. You can be a humble person and know what you can do. And that's an important thing, and it's great. We're going to see an example here of an individual who, who did that. But it's not wrong for us to know what we can do and what we can't do. Know your limits. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. You know what? In the areas where you are blessed, do that. Make those wonderful golden instruments and those brazen animals that are cast. God gave his spirit and have a talent to those musicians and to those artisans to make those things for the temple. Do you apologize for that wonderful gift that God has given? Are we going around apologizing for having the understanding of his plan that gives us so much hope and vision into the future? Are we, are we apologizing for that? Because that's what self-deprecation will lead into. It can lead into that mindset where we're kind of belittling what God has given us. It's not a bad thing to be good at stuff. It's a bad thing to sit there and like, well, look at this city that I have made, this amazing uh, metropolis, and boom, the next thing you know, you got seven years of living out in the, in the wild, eating straw like an ox, right? There's a difference between giving glory to God, because let anyone who glories, glory in God. And so we're to have our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're not, to, we're not to think of ourselves or esteem ourselves more highly than we ought to. But we ought to be able to say, you know what, I wasn't much. But then God took the time to invest in me. And wow, what a difference it has made in my life. All glory to God for what we're able to do and understand and know and be balanced human beings instead of the alternative. And here we see uh, the story of Moses. We're, we're in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Moses says to the Lord, oh, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since, nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. To me, this is an interesting statement to make. It may have been the case. But he was also raised in the household of Pharaoh. Um, and there was a movie a few years back called The King's Speech, that there is a history within nobility to make sure that the presentation of what is seen to the masses is on point. That it is everything that they would think because nobility is, is higher and, and better than the common person, right? And so there's a presentation. So I personally, supposition by Nathan, have a hard time thinking there wasn't some sort of training or some sort of... Uh, um, grooming that occurred in the household of Pharaoh to be able to present yourself in a certain way. So maybe he was fully slow of speech, but I think that we see here in verse 11, uh, God's response to that uh, is a little bit telling as to whether or not this was an actual decent argument to be made by Moses. Because God says to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? It's like, I got you. We'll take care of it. It's not a problem. You can take that excuse and just throw it away. It doesn't work. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he's also coming out to meet you. So we see Moses downplaying. He's like, Oh! Not so, not so keen on doing that. Oh, but no. And he's not speaking in faith that God is going to take care of him. But we also know that Moses, in other areas, is deemed the meekest man. But he was a man who was... He killed a guy to preserve his, 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 uh, his kinsfolk, all right? He was able to command a large group of people, obviously with God's help. But he was not a small personality. If you look at what he did, generally speaking, leaders of large groups of people, you'd be like, oh, well, that's a meek person. No, they have to be bold. They have to be able to really take charge. I mean, you think about who gets elected to be a president. Generally speaking, 
Not someone who is classified as meek, someone who's classified as strong instead, as, as a good decision maker. But when we think about meekness and we think about, when we think about that, we can oftentimes equate it down to someone who uh, defers to other people, who responds in, the, uh, in a more diminutive way. Moses had to be able to work with the people and command in that way, but where his meekness was and where his humility lied was in how he responded. At any time, did he take credit for what he did? No, he said, oh, that, that was God. When his brother and his own sister came up and said, oh, you take too much on yourself, he says, oh, far be it from me. Don't, don't do that. You're speaking against God. Did he get angry for himself? No. When, God, when Korah and Dathan and Abiram, he's like, I'm going to pray for you. And his response was never bringing it upon himself. Again, what we read in Romans. His response was to defer to God. When he had the conversation, and God's like, I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'll start over with you. Well, there's an offer. You know, he, he, that's, that's a pretty uh, hard-to-resist offer from the human nature side of things. But what did he do? He deferred to God in the name of God and his reputation. That's humility. That is meekness. He was not, in that way, uh, skirting his ability and what he needed to do. He was not devaluing like he was here in this conversation with God. Oh, no, 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 I don't think I can speak. Oh, no, 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 I don't think I can. Oh, are you sure you got the right guy? Self-deprecation is not humility. It is, I would classify that as a false humility. You can have some very capable people who are very humble because what they do is they defer to God. They don't belittle what God has invested in them. And so in this second self of self-deprecation, we want to make sure that we're not belittling ourselves. And I would say, again, as, as this can seem akin to humility, it's something that I think that we as Christians need to work on avoiding because we should go boldly. I mean, when, when, when tribulation is the word that's coming to mind, but when... Um, In Jerusalem, when they just came in and just started, Paul started terror, Saul started terrorizing the church, and they left, right? Persecution. There we go. Uh, Tribulation. Uh, we'll get there slowly, Steve. No, um, but when, when persecution is coming, they went out, but they didn't go out so scared that they tucked tail and didn't talk about what God did. What did they do? They went out, and everywhere that they went, they preached the gospel. They were excited. They just couldn't do it there. And so they left where they couldn't do it, and they went somewhere else, and they started preaching, and they started expounding. So you see that, that Philip is an uh, evangelist going up into Damascus and into, into the, the, um, the, the northern parts, and it's an amazing thing. They weren't, they weren't apologetic for who they were. They just couldn't do it where there was persecution, so they left. And it's an important thing for us. We don't want to let this concept of self-deprecation and apologizing for who we are. You know what? We're going to be offensive to a lot of people because a lot of people don't like God's law. That's just how it's going to be. So we can either apologize for what we believe or we can find a way to have a conversation that shares the joy of why what we believe has changed our life, has made it for the better. Or again, we can be self-deprecating and say, well, you know, weak in base, and, and I don't know why God called me. You should know why God called you. You should know, because it's recorded in Scripture. He called us to be a light. He called us to be an example. He called us so that people can see that example and glorify Him. And our job is to help people make that transition when they see us, the weak and the base and the non-noble, do things that they can't comprehend. Because it's different. It's, it's all because of what God has done for us. And that leads us to the third self that we're going to talk about today which is self-examination. Self-examination. This is the examination of one's own state, conduct, and motives. If we're doing this, we're going to realize when we're in a state of self-pity. And I've actually spoken to people who's like, you know, I'm going to have myself a little pity party and then we're going to move on from it, right? And they recognize that that's what they're doing. Because, man, you know, there are times life is just tough. <sighs> And you need to have a cry fest, and you need to have a shoulder upon which you can do that. And so you find good people that you can do that with. But then just like God did with Elijah, you gird up your loins, and you do the job that needs to get done after that. 
But self-examination, the examination of one's own state, our conduct, or our motives. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll see here a very important admonition. 2 Corinthians 13. Oftentimes we will turn to these scriptures as we're preparing for the spring holidays for the Passover. But 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, This will be the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So Paul is saying, this is not the first time I've talked to you. Take note. You know, prick the ears and listen. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now, being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. In other words, saying... This is going to get dealt with. You either deal with it before I come, or when I come, then I'm going to deal with it. But this needs to get dealt with. <laughs> Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but, I'm, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. He's talking to them about overcoming difficulties in life. He's talking to them saying, you know what, I've had to talk to you about this issue, whatever it is, multiple times. Right? And it's likely that we have those things that it says in Hebrews, that the sin that easily befalls us, besets us, ensnares us, those things that we can fall prey to. Multiple times, but he says, you know what, examine yourself. If you're still falling prey to this and you're not overcoming it, you need to look inwardly and ask, are you utilizing the Spirit of Jesus Christ which is in us? That's how we're able to do this. If you're not, you know, start using it. Or maybe you should have a hard question with yourself as to whether or not you have His Spirit in you or, or has it left because you're disqualified, because you're ignoring it. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John Chapter 1, pick it up in uh, verse 5, 1 John 1, verse 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and that the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So John reminds them, this is the reality of life. This is the reality of what it is to be a Christian, to go through the, the process of self-examination, to look in, to make sure that we're actually walking according to our calling. That we're actually doing what we've agreed in that contract with him, signed on that line in that way, in blood, that says, my life is yours. Here's how I'm going to live. Second Peter, chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 5. Another admonition for self-examination. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 5, says, do not spare, and did not, uh, am I in the right spot? Nope, I'm in 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. But it says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. I've talked about, as we've been going through this message, that initial investment that God makes, what are we supposed to do with it? We're supposed to grow it. Expand it. The value that we started with in our walk with God should not be equal to the value that we have at the end. It should grow. It should become a more fruitful investment for Him. Something that is going to, again, bear fruit. And this here 
as we're reading through 1 Peter uh, 1, it's talking about various things that we can go into and make the investment more valuable. Verse 8, for if these things are yours and abound, you will, neither be, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The answer to the question from Matthew 18, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Peter gives the answer right here. Take to your faith and add virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control. If you do these things, you're not blind to what you have to overcome. You know what? There's an entrance that is supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to be diligent in our self-examination to make sure that our calling and election are sure. Again, what are we being called and elected to? To become a kingdom of priests. Well, it's, you need somebody who can boldly go and teach. Somebody who has the strength to handle and the knowledge of how to handle various situations and circumstances within the word of God and what you should then be able to do. This is exactly what Moses, this is why he was tiring out. Because other people didn't have the spirit. Other people didn't understand God's law. He knew it. He had internalized it. And until he went and taught other people to internalize it and know it and to be able to make righteous judgment, well, then he was doing it all solo. And it's exhausting. But we're here to sit there again to become adept at that, to increase in value. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Start to wrap up. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. First Corinthians eleven verse twenty seven. In speaking about the Passover, Paul writes, Therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would, ju if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Self-examination is an extremely important component of our Christian walk. If we don't, we can easily get weak, we can fall asleep, we can become sick, spiritually speaking, right? And what happens if those things happen? We are not to sleep, all slumber, but you know what? When they all woke up, not all of them were prepared, the, the, the virgins. We want to make sure that we're not missing out on that opportunity. So, see, self-examination is extremely important. It is necessary. And we can, we can as, as human beings, so easily get stuck in the mindset of self-pity or self-deprecation. And we can miss the opportunity to do self-examination because, you know what, it, it feels good. It feels nice. I feel supported and encouraged when people understand the difficulty that I'm going through. And so I can have you, yeah, you actually get different uh, uh, neurochemicals and things like that will come into your system, the hormones that will come in and boost you because you're getting the encouragement and, and the support from people for the terrible things you're going through. And so you can have all these conversations about how bad life is and what you're going through and people will give you support and you're like, oh, that's so much better. I feel so much better because somebody heard me, somebody listened to me. But in staying there, we don't move beyond it to move to the self-examination. Why is it that we're going through that? Is there something that I need to do or you need to do? Or how, how, do we, how do we move from that and the difficulty? You know, all Israel did was throw themselves a pity party for what they didn't have to the point that they forgot what they had in front of them. They didn't realize that God was providing for them. They didn't realize that every day they went out and had a miracle. It's only through self-examination that we arrive at the knowledge the truth that, you know, we're really not capable of doing very much at all. 
What we need is we need God. When we're stuck in the self-pity, then it's all external to us. It's all, these things are happening to me. Life is difficult. I have all of these burdens. When it's a self-deprecation, we devalue who we are, and we don't realize or we're unwilling to realize what God is doing in us. It's a very powerful thing. It's a miracle that's going on. But it's through self-examination that we realize, you know what? I need him to be able to get through this difficult time. You know, I need him to increase the value in me. I need him to increase my faith, add to my virtue knowledge, to my knowledge, all the other things that we read about. And uh, I think that was over in Second Peter. But let's go to Matthew chapter 25 in closing. When we go through the process of self-examination, we, we should come to the conclusion we should come to the conclusion that we are what we read in 1 Corinthians, that we are that we are worthless. I won't say worthless, not worthless. That we are not worthless, but that we are weak and base, and that we are not much of and by ourselves. But as we see here in Matthew chapter 25, this is the parable of the talents. We see here that God is willing to invest. If you've ever, there's a I don't know if it's still popular, I guess, because I don't watch broadcast TV. But you ever watch the show Shark Tank, or have you heard of the show Shark Tank? They're asking people to come forward, and they present their ideas, or various businesses. And it's very dramatic, and they try to make it really, you know, hyped up for TV. But what you would notice is, all along the way, the individuals who are investing in a business... They're looking for, yeah, a little bit of the business, but they're looking a lot for the individual who's going to be running the business. And they end up investing in the person almost more they invest than they invest in the idea. Because they need to have somebody who they can be a partner with. They need to be able to have somebody who they can work with. In Matthew chapter 25, we see here, uh, picking up in verse 14, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So again, here we, we see at the outset of this parable that there are individuals with varying capabilities. God recognizes that. Not any less in his eyes, but he gives them according to what they're able to do. And he, again, an honest assessment of their capabilities is not demeaning to anybody. It's not making one better than the other. It just says, okay, you can do this. You can do this. So here you go. Here's what you need. Do business until I return. And he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, and look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Also, he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You see, it didn't matter how many talents he started off with. What, what, is, what is the consistent thing here? He took what God gave him, took what the ruler gave him, and he grew it. He grew it. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. There you have what is yours. Hey, I brought it back. This individual failed to move beyond. Man, they got five talents. Oh, he got, he got two talents? That's twice as... I mean, what am I supposed to do with one? How am I supposed to grow that? What do you expect from me? He's not even around to help me. He's gone. All these things, maybe, that humanly speaking, we can fall into as far as the self-deprecation, as far as the self-pity. Verse 26, But his Lord said, 
answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered. You see, if you were to go and take this into the court of public opinion, well, that just doesn't seem fair. Why'd that guy get five? And this guy only got one. What'd you expect from him? And the ruler says, you, you knew. This, <laughs> this was not news. This is not a surprise that here were my expectations. This is what I expected. So you should have done something. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In another parable, the people complain and say, why are you giving it to the guy with five talents? It's because he did something with it. He moved past feeling sorry for himself and incapable of doing anything. God has given us an amazing talent. We have someone who's seen value in each and every one of us. Even if you don't see it, he sees it. And that should be encouraging. He sees it. And each of us are here together, as we heard in the first message, to stir one another up to love and good works, to grow, to increase what we started off as and become what God would love to be able to have in His family. We're not worthless. You see, it, it can be easy to think of ourselves like that. It's like, oh, I'm worthless. I, I just, I, I keep messing up. I've been in the church all my life and this is still a struggle or whatever it is that we're going through in life it can be easy for us to fall into that that mindset but when you go back and you consider just like what I think it was Peter said what do you have in you isn't isn't that the investment that God has done that Holy Spirit that he's giving to each and every one of us isn't that the most valuable investment that you could ever possibly have to be able to grow take that don't forget that that's in you and grow. Don't, don't devalue that. We have from God the use of His tools, His resources, His expertise, the example of those whom He has also worked with. We have all of it, all of it at our, disposable, at our disposal. But we have to make sure that we're willing to not stay in a situation of self-pity or fall into self-deprecation, but instead take the time to go through the self-examination process because in each and every one of us are those three selves. It's just a matter of which one we stick with.